Good evening. First of all, I'd like to say good evening. My name is Laura Burke. I'm the Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency and delighted to welcome you here to another in our series of climate lectures uh, run in association with the National Dialogue on Climate Action. Um, I'd also, of course, like to welcome those of you who are joining us from our online broadcast, and I know John will talk more about that in a few minutes. And of course, finally, I would like to thank our chairman for this evening, John Bowman, uh, for once again giving his able services to this uh, event. And for those of you who are regular attendees at the Climate Change Lectures, you'll know that John has been with us since the very beginning, um, and I don't think it would be a climate lecture without uh, him minding us in particular through the question and answer session. So the backdrop theme to tonight's lecture is climate change and health. It's unique in the lecture series to date as we've previously really dealt with the subject matters such as climate, the science of climate change, climate communications and climate policy response. Um, we have in the past also dealt with the potential impact to health but indirectly and tonight we are really taking on this subject matter head on. Uh, looking in particular at the force multiplier effect that climate change presents for a range of existing sustainability and healthcare challenges. And I suppose you might ask, well, why the, is the EPA talking about health? Um, and why are we interested in health? Well, quite simply, uh, the quality of our environment impacts the quality of our health. Uh, environmental pollution has a negative impact on our health and a good quality environment has health benefits. A clean and well-protected environment is foundational to a healthy Ireland. Clean air and clean water, as we've said before, are not luxury items, but these are basic needs and should be treated as valuable assets that need to be to protected to benefit our health and also the wider economy. Across a ra wide range of functions, uh, be it air or water quality, industrial regulation, research, chemicals control, radon awareness, waste prevention, drinking water. Uh, we're working in the EPA to protect your health. The most recent EPA State of the Environment report identified seven key priorities for the protection of our environment, including environment health and well-being. But all seven of the priorities, whether that be climate change, water, ecosystems, sustainability, they're all interrelated and there can be co-benefits of actions in one area to another area. So for example, climate change and air quality actions. Climate change is now with us and the sooner we act, the less damage will be done to our society, our economy and our environment. In the last year, we have by any measure experienced an extraordinary period where our environment and our climate reminded us just of the fragile nature of our infrastructure, our economy, our food production systems, and of course, by extension, our well-being. A year where nature reminded us just who is in charge and which focused us on what we need to do to stop aggravating the situation and to adapt. Drinking water systems were knocked out, wastewater treatment systems were knocked out, power lost, roads became impassable, sea defences damaged, homes and businesses inundated, primary food production systems um, very badly compromised, and our healthcare services also put under severe pressure. And I suppose it's also important to remember that during that period of extreme weather, lives were lost, um, and the eco economic costs were measured in billions of euros. So the messages are clear, uh, the interconnectivity is certain, and the need for coherent, integrated and relentless action is compelling. Planning for climate change impacts through adaptation actions is essential, uh, not only from an environmental perspective, but also for Ireland's social and economic resilience. The 2009 and 2015 Lancet Commission reports in relation to climate change and health concluded that climate change is a medical emergency, but also that a comprehensive response to climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. And this is because of the co-benefits of climate action directly impacting on health outcomes. 
So our speaker tonight, Professor Hugh Montgomery, was part of the Lancet Commission 2015 report and is one of the co-chairs of the 2016 to 2030 programme of work known as the Lancet Countdown, tracking progress on health and climate change, which was uh, commissioned and commenced in response to the Lancet Commission's work. Hugh's lecture tonight considers this, the systemic nature of the pressures on our environment and by extension our health, for they are indivisible. And through examination of the interconnected current and near future challenges to harmonious and sustainable human occupation of our blue planet, and through looking at these symptoms, he prompts us on what is to be done for this malaise. So tomorrow then at the EPA's annual uh, Environment and Health and Wellbeing Conference, which I should say is not just the EPA, it's EPA and HSC, uh, we're going to look at what has been done in the area of health and environment through research, programs and innovations currently being un undertaken and which will be required to prepare us for the challenges to come. The EPA, for our part, are actively pursuing research on nationally relevant policy solutions that support transitions to a low-carbon, sustainable and resi resilient society and economy. But overall, we are together and proactively identifying and generating the evidence necessary to understand these challenges and to inform action. The Climate Change Lecture Series has and will continue to be an important public engagement opportunity where the, climate, uh, where the impact of climate change can be explained and discussed in an open and constructive way. Recording of these lectures are also placed online as an enduring educational resource. And I believe, and I know that my colleagues in the EPA believe, that the open public dialogue, supported by research and evidence, will make for more timely and more successful interventions, because only with a whole of society engagement will we be likely to succeed in our transition ambitions. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to our chairman, John Bowman, for the evening, and I look forward to your participation uh, during the evening, and in particular, at question time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Laura, and welcome to the round room of the Mansion House. I know that many of you have been with us here before as part of this uh, EPA Climate Lecture Series, so you probably know the format. Our speaker will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we will have a similar duration for questions from the floor. Um, and perhaps it's best that they be focused uh, on what we've just heard from the speaker. I think it's unfair to our very distinguished guest speakers in this series for members of our audience to attempt sometimes to co-opt them as lobbyists for some local issue in Ireland about which our speakers could not know the full context. So I will invite our audience to curb any enthusiasms they might have on, the, on that front. Um, some housekeeping announcements, the emergency exits are as labelled or as uh, signed. Um, mobile phones should of course be switched off. Um, tonight's lecture is also being webcast live and uh, among those special groups watching, there's the Galway Environmental uh, Network, who are co foregathering in NUI Galway um, to hear tonight's lecture. So we would welcome questions too from them. And they can send them in online. The lecture and the questions and answers session are being recorded as usual by the EPA, and the material will be made available on the EPA Ireland YouTube channel following on from the event and it may be used in future uh, EPA uh, communications. And when it comes to questions uh, sessions, I will ask questioners to identify themselves and to stand the better to be seen by our cameras, and if they could mention their organization, if any, so we can see the spin, if any. Now, we're also accepting questions via Twitter using um, hashtag climate lecture 2018. Now, along with what uh, Laura has already told you, Dr. Hugh Montgomery um, is Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at University College London and Director of the Centre for Human Health and Performance uh, at that same university. He's published over 450 scientific papers um, and he is also, he has also been awarded the title of London Leader by the London Sustainable Development Commission for his work in climate change and health. 
He has also authored a number of scientific books, two children's novels, in which I suspect he smuggles some of his key ideas, the better to bring along the next generation. And he is a keen competitor in the ultra marathon that runs for 100 kilometers, not just 26 miles plus. Would you welcome Professor Hugh Montgomery, Health and Climate Change, Query a Febrile Planet. Well, good evening and thank you for the kind words and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, there's probably a health warning attached to this lecture. This isn't a lecture that's going to leave you feeling elated, I don't think. There's not a lot of good news to be told. But I'm going to start, at least on an upbeat note, so I'm going to tell you the only joke I know about climate change. So if you know another one, I'm really desperate to hear it, please. And the, story, the joke goes like this. There are two planets talking to one another, and one planet says, do you know what? I don't feel so good. I, I think I've got homo sapiens. <laughs> and the other planet says, oh, I wouldn't worry, it doesn't last for long. So this is my day job. Um, when I'm not doing research and so forth, I look after intensive care patients, and most of them look a little bit like this. And while some of them are young, fit, healthy people who get struck with something sudden and catastrophic, the bulk have built up an accumulated burden of disease over time, and then one more thing comes in and it sees them off. In my case, it sees off around 30% of my patients, which I hasten that isn't, I don't think, because I'm horribly negligent, but... Um, just the nature of those sick people. So I'm going to start the first part of this talk, um, and I'm going to put my clock down so I can make sure I don't overrun, with nothing to do with climate change. I'm going to start with the burden of disease that the planet is suffering from before the climate change hits. And that burden of disease really comes from us. So multi-celled life on the planet, a little over 4 billion years, well, life on the planet, multi-celled life, around 400, uh, 320 million years, um, hominids, a few million, humanity, a few hundred thousand. And if we go back just 2,000 years, the population didn't really shift very much until we hit the agricultural and industrial revolutions. So we'd reached our first billion in around 1804, and it took well over 120 years to add another billion. But then it only took 33 years to add the next billion. And we've been stacking another billion people on our planet every 12 to 14 years ever since. We've now broken through a little over 7.6 billion people on our planet. Now we can look at what those people are consuming in terms of global domestic product, and this has been inflation adjusted to $2,010, and you can see that the shape of the graph is very much the same. Not much happens until we hit first the agricultural and then the industrial revolution, and then things really take off but the scales are different. The dollars per capita has gone up 31-fold. And that's underpinned, therefore, by the use of an awful lot of stuff. So whatever those dollars mean, they mean soil, water, phosphates, uranium, tin. It could be pretty much anything you think of. But that graph you saw there, that reflects what we have been doing to our planet in that short space of time. And I'm not going to cover all of those things. I'm just going to give you a few headlines. So let's just look at fish. That's world fish production. In fact, I should have changed the dates because I have updated the slide deck. This is last year's 2017 data. 171 billion kilograms of fish for human consumption. That's more than 22 kilograms per man, woman, child, and baby on the planet. And you'll see that what we're harvesting from the seas has pretty much leveled off. And that's not because humanity has got sensible and realized that we're overfishing. It's because it's getting harder and harder to extract the fish from the sea, even with greater technology. And so we've started supplementing our wish to eat fish with aquaculture. Um, and rather sadly, of course, a lot of fish that we catch in the sea are getting minced up and fed to fish we're growing because people want salmon and so forth. The net result of that is we're collapsing taxa of fish stock, this covering most of the major fisheries areas around the world. And if you look at the cumulative loss, you'll see that we're dramatically dropping off if you look particularly at the bottom blue line in collapsed taxa. 
And that's partly because when you lose diversity in an ecosystem, the ecosystem starts collapsing. We need richness and diversity in an ecosystem for it to survive. And when we start fishing out fish, those ecosystems themselves start collapsing. These data, I think, speak for themselves, and I'll let you read them. So that's fish. At the same time, we're destroying the ecosystems in which those fish live. And if we just look at coral, whether it be from pollution or indeed sunscreen that gets onto them from people swimming, or whether it be dynamiting for fishing, or whether it be climate change, which we'll come to later, we're getting these massive bleaching events where the zooanthellae are ejected from the coral, coral, coral making them vulnerable uh, to mechanical damage. And sometimes those coral reefs won't recover. But if you look at these again, the coral reefs which protect an awful lot of shorelines around the world, which are home to hugely diverse ecosystems, and the food which feeds many people, are gravely under threat. And we're not talking about a few percentage points here, as you can see. This is probably the only other extraneous slide I'm putting in. I just wanted to remind you that these things, it's not just about overfishing. I'm not touching on issues such as pollution this evening at all. But I want you to have that in the back of your mind as well. And I put this in only because this is very topical at the moment, isn't it, since David Attenborough's Blue Planet. Anyway, we're overfishing, we're destroying the marine habitat. Look at crop production. We've got more and more people on the planet all wanting to eat more and more. So we're growing more and more grain. And that graph on the left is not slowing down. Look at the number of animals we're having to kill and harvest. More people on the planet, all of those people wanting to eat more and more red meat. Colossal quantities of red meat being produced. All of that, the growing of crops, the feeding of the crops, the cattle, the watering of the cattle, let alone sanitation and what we would all use for ourselves, means we're using a lot more water. So just for those crops, that's what we take for a litre, uh, for a kilogram of wheat. A kilogram of rice is very much more water intensive. But a kilogram of red meat, because you've got to grow the crops and water the cattle, is dramatically more intensive. It's a lot of water. Now, you'd like to think that this is sustainable, but it's not. And I've just tried to think of uh, something where I could put this into numbers that are a bit more understandable. So I'm being clear, I'm not having a go at McDonald's beef burgers at all. I'm just producing the McDonald's data because they make it public, so one can do a little bit of the maths. So that's what McDonald's say they currently sell in terms of individual burgers, around 75 a second. Each apparently weighs 45.5 grams. There you are. There's a bit of pub trivia for you this evening. That's the number of kilograms of red meat alone. That's the number of litres of water. And if you think of that as the water production in Africa, it's the annual extracted fresh water for all of those countries. That's just the water for just one beef burger from one brand. And now think of all the other things we use water for. Now, you, most of you would probably say, well, why are you worried about that, Hugh? It's not a problem, because we all understand the water cycle. It rains, goes and soaks through the soil, goes into rivers, evaporates, goes into the sea where it evaporates, or it lands on plants, gets sucked up through roots, transpires, goes back. It's a continual, perpetual cycle. Well, it's true in part, but a huge amount of the crop production upon which we depend depends upon groundwater some of which which fills over years, a great deal of which, the fossil aquifers though, come from water that was sealed over a 10 million year period and will not refill under even those sorts of geological timescales. Once those groundwater aquifers or the deep water aquifers run dry, that's it. So let's look at the unsustainable use of water. It's all around the world. This is Iran, with whom we've done a lot of work in recent years. It's not just Iran. Look at California. Look at the quantities of groundwater being drained, cubic kilometers of water being drained. The Colorado River Basin, just in those years, drained 65 cubic kilometers of water. 
Look at those fossil aquifers, the high river, subtended by a fossil aquifer. When that runs dry, that's the rice production for 120 million people will go in one go. And if you look at the North China Plain, that will be the wheat production for over half a billion people will disappear in one go when that aquifer runs dry. And these are everywhere. The Ogallala Aquifer in North America subtends the crop production for eight states. So all around the world, we are really very, very vulnerable. Here are some pictures. This is the Aral Sea on the Kazakh-Uzbek border. 1989, it was a little over 171,000 square kilometers. This is what happened to it by 2014. This is Lake Chad. And if we look more closely, that's just the huge loss. It's only 500 square, that should be score square kilometers, not square meters. There are 500 square kilometers left out of what was 15,000 square kilometers. This is Lake Omiya. Uh, in northwest Iran, 1972 to today, or a couple of years ago. And these are some pictures I took a few years ago. It was the sixth largest salt water lake in the world, and it's retreated like this. And you see this rather pathetic thing of these sort of play rafts that they're now just completely grounded on salt. And that ship, five years ago, was in 54 feet of water. So it's not just unsustainable use of fish and destruction of their habitat. It's not just the destruction of the planet in which we're growing the crops or the cows. It's not just that we're draining fossil aquifers at a rate where they can't be refilled because that would take tens of millions of years. We're also destroying the soil that we grow our crops on. Every time you till soil mechanically, you break it up and around 1% of that topsoil blows away. So if you think of anywhere that's had crops growing on it for 100 years, you can't grow anything on that topsoil. And this isn't an issue of fertilizer. Once the topsoil's gone, you're looking at hundreds or thousands of years for it to return. And in that time, you won't be able to grow any crops. That was said in 2006, and it's still largely held to be true. And indeed, even over my side of the water, our environment minister, Michael Gove, is pointing out that we've probably only got 30 years of topsoil left in the United Kingdom on which we can grow things. 30 years. For many of you in this audience, that's your lifetime and a lot longer beyond. And for some of us in the audience, that's our children. The net result of all of this is that if you're stripping out the land that you can grow stuff on and it's becoming exhausted, and you can't grow things on the North Pole because that's water, and the South Pole because it's too cold, and you can't grow it anywhere steep or high or dry or anyone that's already growing, or places where the topsoil's run out, or where we've got cities, there's not much left that you can start growing crops on. That's the driver for deforestation. That's the driver for chopping down rainforests at the rate that you see there. 20 soccer pitches a minute of rainforests being chopped down. And it's not just the rainforests. We've lost a huge proportion of just the broadleaf forests in temperate climates as well. These data here came from the Living Planet Index, published only last week. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail. Look up Living Planet Index 2018, and you can look at those slides for yourselves. But this just gives you a series of short graphs about the sorts of pressures we're putting on our ecosystems and the Earth system trends as well. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but each box represents a forcing uh, which is adverse to our planet and our ecosystem. The net result of this is that there's less life, a lot less life. So the Living Planet Index monitors a series of index species and their numbers, which are informative of a large range of such species, so that one can calculate the numbers of animals in particular taxa. It's indexed 1970, so it's considered that 1970 was the optimum time, that's as many animals as we know about, we've lost 60% of the vertebrates on the planet since then. Um, I was eight in 1970, if you're interested. 
So this has happened since I was a child, 60%. Central and South America, we're down by 90%. 90%. Look at freshwater vertebrates, 83% down. And it's not just the numbers. We're driving a mass extinction. The biggest and fastest mass extinction on the planet in the fossil record by a factor of around 10,000 fold, and you're living through it now. You're living through the biggest, fastest mass extinction the planet has ever witnessed. And as the United Nations Environmental Agency points out, we're losing somewhere around four to eight species um, an hour. That's what you're living through now. And that's on top of that that climate change is acting. So as we heard just now, this is about interactions. It's not just about climate change happening as some existential threat that sits on its own. It's interacting with this. And without climate change, we're in terrible, terrible trouble. But you add climate change to that, and it becomes absolutely desperate. So let's just look at how quickly we've been changing things. And the problem is the human lifespan. It's very hard for us to see the human narrative going back beyond perhaps our, our parents, maybe our grandparents. But if we go back a little over 150 years ago, this was the situation. Most of the lighting in New American cities, such as New York, came from whale oil. And it wasn't in a little over 150 years ago the first commercial oil well was ever drilled. And it was only a little over 67 feet deep. The first light bulb was invented a little over 130 years ago, but it was a good experiment. There was nothing to plug it into. A little over 100 years ago, only 8,000 licensed motor vehicles in the whole of the United States of America. I'm of an age where I can remember the jet set, those fabulously rich people who could afford to buy an aeroplane ticket, because it was only a little over 1952 the first jet ticket could be sold. And the first smartphone appeared experimentally in the year 2000. But look what's happening now if you look at light bulbs. Just in Europe and the US, 126 a second are being sold. 1.4 billion licensed, that's licensed motor vehicles on the planet from 8,000 in the US 100 years ago. Aeroplane tickets, 1951, there were no commercial jet tickets sold at all. These were last year's data. 130 people boarding a second. And in terms of phones, they're ubiquitous. The point being that all of these things take a lot of energy to manufacture, and they usually take a lot of energy to run. And since it's topical with the plastics, if you look at the oil that goes into making a plastic bottle, extracting the water, cleaning it, shipping it, chilling it, and sticking it on your shelf, it's about a third of a litre of oil for one litre of water. So these are the data from last year. This is what humanity was burning last year. And those numbers aren't going down. The carbon dioxide we're releasing is going into an atmosphere that is very small. If you were to wrap the world's atmosphere into a ball at standard temperature and pressure at sea level, it's the size of that pink blob compared to the size of the Earth. It's very, very thin, very thin. And if you put a lot of carbon dioxide into a very small volume very quickly, it's just physics. The concentration goes up. These are the Mauna Loa Observatory data, the so-called Keeling data. That graph shouldn't be going up at all. The sawtooth you're seeing there is, is almost like, feels like the Earth's breathing, isn't it? And it sort of is. The fall is the spring. It's the carbon dioxide being drawn down by trees and plant life from the atmosphere. And then as those leaves fall and start rotting in the autumn and winter, the carbon dioxide levels go up. But this should be going along at a flat level, and it's not. It's going up steeply because we're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere the whole time. 
Let's put that on a longer historical basis. This is going back over the last 10,000 years. Look at the speed with which things have changed. Let's go back even further. This is the last 800,000 years. This is absolutely unprecedented, not just in scale, but in speed of rise. Um, this was the highest peak yet recorded, and it was recorded in May this year. That was on the upstroke in Hawaii before it comes back down. Steady rise, 412 parts per million. You are breathing now the highest carbon dioxide concentration any human has ever breathed, or any hominid come to that. The net result is that that lets shortwave radiation through, it traps longwave radiation. And I don't much like the phrase global warming because it's not really about the warming. It's about energy gain. And that added mass of greenhouse gases is produced during a radiative forcing of around 1.6 watts per square meter. So do some maths in your head and work out how many square meters you think this hall is. Multiply it by one and a half and imagine that radiator running at that number of watts. And then put that over the entire Earth's surface. That's the energy that's being added to our atmosphere. And if you do the maths, it works out at around five Hiroshima bombs a second being added and not going away. And it's when you add energy to an atmosphere that you get weather. So it's no surprise that we're seeing more extreme weather events over time. So the temperature is rising. That's the left-hand panel. Ice sheets are melting. Here's a NASA picture. As it's progressed 2012. Here are the latest data. <laughs> Sea levels are rising in the Thames estuary by around 4.2 millimetres a year. None of you in Ireland will be divorced from that at all, as you're seeing what's happening in my area of Ireland, I know best being the west coast. Um, the huge amounts of coastal erosion as sea levels rise and extreme weather events uh, cause that coastal erosion. And this climate change is a force multiplier, as I say, with all of the environmental impacts which we've discussed before. So think of that patient. It's the climate change that will see us off this planet on top of what we're already doing to it. So as was alluded to earlier, the first Lancet Commission was in 2009 and it put out this statement. And we've had no reason in the subsequent commissions to change that at all. The threat has only, when we look at it more closely, got worse and worse. And I'm not going to give you the most detailed lecture that you need. I'm going to give you the headlines of why this matters to human health. Straightforward, isn't it? If you go to a warm country and you get salmonella on your chicken, it replicates faster and you're more likely to get a dodgy tummy. So bacterial growth rates go up. We know that oceanic and river algal blooms, which can be very toxic, increase in frequency and intensity and toxicity. We know that spring is coming earlier. The pollen season is longer. Pollen densities are greater and that a lot of those pollens are changing to become more allergenic. So we're seeing rises in asthma rates, for instance. We know that photochemical reactions of high temperatures are leading to higher ground level ozone level layers. This is not the, the stuff up the top that's good that keeps ultraviolet light away. This is toxic ozone at ground level that you don't want to be breathing in. But you might say, well, look, come on, Hugh, none of that really worries me very much. Um, we can put fridges in to look after our chicken and I won't go out when the weather's polluted. It's not a big deal. And you're probably right. Those are not the big players. If you lived in some countries, though, vector-borne diseases would be a problem. So specifically, schistosomiasis carried by a snail, dengue, and malaria carried by um, mosquitoes. This was malarial transmission modelling. Uh, we've exceeded the 225 predictions. Um, red is a certainty of malarial transmission. And we're already, say, gone past the 225, but this is the way it's modeled to go. And that's because the temperatures are higher, and you need higher temperatures for mosquitoes to live, but you get more rainfall because you add energy to a climate system, you get more weather, which means more rain. Dengue is a flavor virus. It's very prevalent. Some of you who have traveled in this room may have had it or know people who had. It's known as breakbone fever because that's what it feels like. It feels like someone's malleted all your bones and broken them. And whilst it can kill you from the hemorrhagic 
components of that. It's also very, very debilitating. So if you're a crop worker, a manual worker, you won't be crops for your family when you have it. And it's very much like the malarial story. When the temperatures go up and it's wet, the mosquitoes breed faster. There are more of them. The temperatures rise. They feed more. The parasite replicates more in their stomach, and the transmissibility of that dengue goes up. So there are all those reasons. The same would apply uh, to malaria. And these are work we've done with the Lancet Countdown, which is what you've heard. It's a five and a half million funded Welcome Trust initiative where we're monitoring the impacts of climate change on health and the action to address it. And you can see this business of vectoral capacity, which is the summation of the replication of the bug, plus the parasite and its feeding patterns, have gone up very dramatically. China is in the midst of its greatest and biggest ever dengue uh, fever epidemic. It's been going on for some years now. Very, very large numbers of people being increasingly affected directly due to climate change. So, a whole bunch of things that you're probably not too worried about. You're probably not worried too much about dengue and malaria yet in Ireland. I don't think you have reason to be terribly worried for a while yet. But this matters to food production as well. Let me remind you of the impacts we're having on fish production and fish availability already from the Limit Planet Index before climate change has interacted. And they've modelled the impacts of climate change. That's the little sort of orange bar to the left. So these effects on fish stocks at the moment are not mainly due to climate change. It hasn't yet really hit, but it's going to. And it's going to hit partly because these other effects for instance, on coral reef, this ejection of zoanthellae, of which we spoke earlier. There's a classic picture, 2014, a rather rich coral reef on the left. Then it gets bleached in Samoa in 2015, directly because temperatures rise too high, and it can't survive, and it dies. What then happens is that coral gets broken down by waves that are coming in, for which it would normally be resilient, then those waves can come into the shore. And then you start getting salt water affecting where crops are grown. That was 2016. 93% of the Great Barrier Reef affected. 93%. And that was 1998 and 2006. There's a red rash of measles, of major severe bleaching events, the red ones that are being severe. And that's only escalated since. And it's not just the fish. It's crop production. Ten years ago, we were all being told that ah, you didn't have to worry about crops because while some areas would do quite badly, more CO2, more temperature, a bit more rainfall would mean that some areas would grow a lot more crops. And that is evidently nonsense to anyone who's ever had a garden. Because all you need is one cold snap, one wet snap, one drought to wipe your crop out, and that's what we're getting more of. And as a direct result of that, we're getting loss of crops. Now, this crop modelling here is only due to the effects of drought and higher temperatures. It's not yet modelled in the effects of the extreme weather events because you can't model those in very well. So we're in trouble for world food production, even if we had enough water, land, and soil. That's the graph of the extreme weather events. It's nothing more than you expect when you add energy to a climate system. That does matter to humans. And it's interesting that until the last report we did, risk to humans have been based on global mean temperature rises over the entire Earth's surface. But of course, people don't live on the entire Earth's surface. They didn't, don't tend to live on the sea. And they tend to live in big cities, in particular geolocations. Where you look where vulnerable people are, that's often people who aren't actually that old. People over 65 is pretty young. But are, people over 65 are much more vulnerable to extreme heat. And where you look where those people are living and where those populations are rising, there's very substantial threat. We know that productivity is declining. In hot environments, hotter than your core temperature, um, you're gaining heat from the atmosphere the entire time. And the only way you can stay cool is by sweating. And if you can't drink enough, then you die. Simple as that. You certainly can't do extra work. And so labour productivity is falling. 
as a direct result of climate change. But there are other impacts. This was the big heat wave event of 2010 in Central Europe, particularly focused on Russia. The same year that a fifth of the entire land surface area of Pakistan was underwater. And that had implications, particularly because Kazakhstan, which was a major grain exporter, suddenly became a major grain importer. It couldn't generate enough crops because of the collapse in production. That drove up wheat prices from a little over $150 a metric tonne to a little over $350 a metric tonne. And you didn't notice that here any more than I did, because supermarkets will cap the prices because they need you to go in to buy toilet cleaners, CDs, and red wine. Uh, they need you to be in buying your milk and your grain at low price. But if you were in a poor country where you had to pay that price directly, you wouldn't have been able to feed your family. And that had very substantial uh, military implications, about which we'll speak shortly. As sea levels rise, you can see large numbers of people on the right is Bangladesh, will lose their habitation completely, let alone where they can grow crops. And that's not even talking about Himalayan meltwaters, which are diminishing, coming uh, in from the north. These sorts of things matter to security. India worked that out a long time ago. And these data were first presented at the Royal United Services Institute over 10 years ago. When India completed what they called their wall, it's not. It's a seven meter high, double thickness razor wire and steel fence along the entire border with Bangladesh to keep the climate migrants out when they start moving. And as was said at that meeting, it probably won't work because if you're starving, you'll get through a seven meter high fence. You're just gonna be a lot angrier when you get through. So starvation will matter to people. The poverty that comes from it, as we said earlier, when the crop grain prices went up, led to instability. And as Nick Stern pointed out some years ago, the impacts to global e economies are absolutely colossal. Of course, he's retracted this statement since because he said it's going to be a lot worse than that. This was a, was a severe underestimate of the severity of the problem. So in the last few minutes then, here's the sort of synergistic map of health impacts for you. Climate change driving heat waves, ground level ozone, pollen, pollen allergenicity and so forth driving respiratory disease. Cardiovascular disease from smoke, ground level ozone and so forth from the heat waves themselves. All of these effects from flooding and drought and reduced work capacity, fires and so forth, combining with ecosystem collapse to mean that you're getting loss of crops, stunting and starvation. Flooding leading to sewage, but also nitrates being flooded down, producing chemical poisoning along with algal blooms. The changes in bacterial disease patterns and diarrhea. The change in vector-borne diseases. All of those driving poverty, loss of habitation, combining with the starvation to lead to mass migration, which we've seen. And the consequence of all of those things is conflict. So if you want me to put my money on the table and say, where's the biggest threat first from climate change and health? It's war, and it's coming to a place near you very soon. The Pentagon have known this for a long time. This is an unredacted document now from 2003. You've got to love the phrasing, haven't you, that climate change is likely to lead to a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. They're talking about billions of people dying. And I put these slides in because sometimes these issues of environmental matters and climate change are framed politically. They're framed as being something to do with woolly-minded liberals who wear sandals and grow beards and hug trees and eat muesli. And it's not like that. This, these are hardcore, serious right-wing individuals, by my book anyway, coming out with these sorts of statements. That may be pejorative, but that's how I would view uh, many of the military.
So climate change is a massive threat, but let me just remind you that it's on the background of up to eight extinctions an hour, and this massive collapse in the number of species on our planet. And if we think it's bad now at a little over one degree, what nonsense is it that we're talking about a deal to try to stay below two? Two? It's insane. And not only is it insane, we can't stay below two. There isn't a hope in hell. And the, the reason for that, let me just go back to that last slide, by the way, to point out what happens if we get to four. So this is the philosophical transactions in 2011. I doubt that anyone would disagree with that statement. So you don't like one, you're not going to like two, and if you've got anywhere close to four, it's over for you. These are known as representative concentration pathways, or RCPs. If we were to try to stay below two, you'd be on RCP 2.1 or RCP 2.6. You'd have to plant the entire crop-producing area of Europe with biofuels to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. You'll need geoengineering to achieve that. So that's not going to happen at all. Currently, you're heading much more towards RCP 8.5, which will take us to somewhere north of 900 parts per million. And that will put you on a trajectory of well over five degrees in the lifetime of your children, if you have children. Just think about that. Think about the fact we've lost 60% of the life on this planet of vertebrates since I was a small child. And think about what we're now suggesting we add in the form of climate change. Don't believe that the Paris deal is doing anything, because it isn't. We haven't peaked in our greenhouse gas emissions. We haven't even started reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. They're still going up. There was a small pause when the global economy did its tanking. But now things are picking up again. It's business as usual. And when we're seeing more wind farms and more solar, it's not substituting for fossil fuels. It's adding energy to a, a different global mix of energy production. That's how Monty Python would have seen humanity's behavior. And let me take you back to the joke with which I started. One planet says to the other, I'm not feeling so good. I think I've got homo sapiens. And the other one says, I wouldn't worry it doesn't last for long. And it's not so funny 40 minutes into the talk. So that's where I'm going to stop. I hope I've come in at my 40 minutes because the purpose of the evening wasn't really for me to give you a diatribe. Some of you will probably want to leave and slash your wrists right now, which is um, fine, or drink yourselves into a stupor. But for those of you that don't have to dash, and you're very welcome to, um, I'll stick around to take some questions. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, because um, if there's an answer, it will be from people younger than me. And children in particular are incredibly proactive about changing. Um, so the reason I actually have written a children's book, and there is a, a school's program, which any of you are welcome to have. It's completely free, and you can have all the materials when you want them. Um, I went to see an advertising guru to say, how do we change human behavior on this issue? <clears throat> and he said, the problem is, it's like a health message. You're telling people not to do something they're finding immediately pleasurable that's associated with a longer-term risk. And those classic examples are unprotected sex, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes. A lot of those things to be fun now, and there's some risk downstream. And humans aren't good at that. The way they change their behaviors is with a consistent and consistently applied message from a trusted vector with emotional buy-in, and so the answer is children, because they will nag you, and you will do it because you love them. 
Very good. Um, yes, question here. Hi, uh, Kevin Kelleher from Public Health and the Health Services here. Hugh, just a couple of things I wanted to say. Hmm. One is about your, some of your earlier slides, particularly where you showed the world population growth. Yes. Isn't that the fundamental issue we're having to deal with? Is how do we look after seven million people? Yes. And then it leads to my second point. And I'm not sure how you get to those solutions, because it's mm. a problem. My second point is the issue of environmental justice. Right. And I think it's a real big problem, because I've just been to India, mm. and, you know, we are dreadful people mm. living like we do when people live like they do in India. And then we start talking about things like this and start to pretend it's the pollution, it's the activity of the Chinese or the Indian. Yeah. when you know it's it, is it you know so i think there's a big issue here mm. about both how are we going to live i mean the reason our population grew was because we controlled infectious diseases mm. and we made sure people were able to eat good food and clean water and then secondly there's the issue of mm. you know birth control right so how are we, that's the big issue yeah is how do we deal with not seven billion people and do it environmentally just Right. So uh, taking each point of turn, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it was, oddly enough, something that was almost verboten to talk about. Um, so when we did the first Lancet Commission, which reported in 2009, there was an awful lot of pressure not to mention population control, because it was considered politically completely off the table to talk about it. Um, thank heavens that's not the issue now. But it is a problem. I don't see how we can sustain 7.6 billion people on a planet, let alone if people are saying, well, we might level off at 10 billion. 10 billion? You know, another two and a half billion on top of what we've got and we can't cope now, especially when those people, as you quite rightly say, coming from poverty, why should they not expect to eat red meat or more fish or anything else that might come? That inflection that we've seen before can only get bigger. And I don't think that is sustainable. On the issue of justice and equity, it's very interesting. For those of you that have been to the COP negotiations, and I know there are one or two here that have been to the negotiations, it was always the issue raised by other nations outside those that were fully developed. And they were saying, this is about historical equity. You people in the West, you had your time. You grew to give yourselves the civilization you've got now. You filled up the space in the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. That's not our fault, and now it's our turn. And if there's a problem, it's for you to fix. So that's the historical equity argument. The one that resonates much more with me is the intergenerational equity argument. Because I can tell you right now, my children, who are 12 and 16, don't give a monkeys about whose fault it was in the past they don't see why they, as of the next generation, should suffer in their country or in anyone else's. So the narrative has to change to one of intergenerational equity, and we do need to start seeing countries working genuinely together. The problem with the Paris deal and others, which I won't go into at great length now, is this business of nationally determined contributions, that every country can say, well, we're, you know, given our political situation and our economic situation, our sociological situation, we're going to set our own determined limits on what we aspire to do. And unsurprisingly, most people aren't being very ambitious in that regard. So I'm not sure I've given you an answer to the question. I don't think it's sustainable with that number of people. I think nature will probably bite back and we'll see populations decline at some point for the reasons I've given you. Um, and in terms of justice, we need people to grow up a bit in terms of politicians and start thinking about generations, not countries. Mm. Yes, here. Yes, um, Farag Badaf, formerly UNEP and uh, represented ISD, International mm. Society of Doctors for the Environment at many COPs and environmental meetings. Mm. Given the fact here that we're, we're facing a multiplicity of crises, the climate crisis, the bio crisis, the political and all the rest, mm. and given the fact that it's very unlikely, certainly we, we cannot depend on our national and international agencies to deal with this problem, it's very, very clear. I mean, yesterday we heard mm. at the event in Trinity College, the climate event, from one of the negotiators not to expect anything in, in terms mm. of action. 
given that fact, can you give any tips? I mean, the children's books are, are, are very good ideas, but given, can you give us any tips on how possibly we could raise the consciousness in people to actually change, to really start changing? I mean, I, I spent some time recently with the Kogi tribe in, 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 in Colombia, in the High Sierras, and they are uh, um, totally self-sustainable. They, they, they don't have any contact with the outside world, but they have a more, far more sense of urgency of what's happening on our planet than we have here in the West. And I'm mm. just wondering, can you give us any tips that we might possibly bring a level of consciousness um, uh, to our communities? I think, I, I can't probably, I think the answer has to be individuals. Um, the, the news media, you, those of us that have had to work with them over the years, and this isn't being, again, pejorative, they, they talk about stories, not news. So you talk to them, they say there's no such thing as news, there's only stories. So if they've done the climate change story, then it's no longer story again which is why you get these individual little blips, which we know doesn't change behaviours because it needs to be much more consistent. So those consistent messages can only, in my view, come from one place, and that has to be us. If we get the politics right and convince our politicians to act, then they might start putting out the consistent message. But this is a very ugly tessellation of government in any country, big businesses and people, and the government is saying, well, if we raise the climate change issue and say we'll change taxes and we'll change agriculture and business and everything else, no one will vote for us, which is certainly in the UK why no one mentions it at all at elections. Then you've got businesses saying, well, if government won't legislate, how are we meant to operate unless you make a level of playing field in that regard? And then you've got the public saying, well, if the politicians won't do it and the businesses won't provide us with the stuff, what are we meant to do? So everyone's locked into inactivity. And then you tessellate that around the world where you might say, well, let's suppose the Irish government suddenly decides they're going to do everything, be the greenest government in the entire world, you'll get businesses saying, well, we can't compete internationally if you do that, so businesses will offshore. Um, everyone is locked into inactivity. So the activity, it seems to me, has to come from us as individuals. And we've only really got two powers, haven't we? One is voting, if we think that matters anymore. In some places it might not and the other's money, and where we spend and where we save. Those have to be the pressure points, but it has to be us as individuals. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm a research scientist. Yeah, I'm a research scientist from the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada, mm. and I've been working with paleoecology and trying mm. to model future climate trends, landscape erosion and so forth. And what you mentioned is really, really important, is are we at fault as a scientist for not communicating what we've learned to the people? Because I'm finding, I'm working in southern Italy, that they're hungry for information. Mm. And yet I get the feeling that we haven't been doing our job. Yeah. So I'm doing what you're doing, is children's books, right. pamphlets for the people in the, in, the, you know, in the region, communicating with local officials. And what do you think the role of volunteerism and right. actually starting from the grassroots and going up rather than trying to depend upon our governments? Both good points, so I'll take each of them. Um, yes, as scientists, we were shockingly bad. Um, we felt that it was our role merely to put facts out and that we were not part of society. We were apolitical. Our job was merely to present facts and step away. And that's clearly wrong, clearly wrong. Um, and it has been throughout the history of science. When it matters to people, we have to stand up and sound the alarm and speak out against things we think are wrong and support the things we think are right. And we've been shockingly bad. And we've been really bad at communicating it because we speak statistic. So that's allowed journalists or anyone else to say, how certain are you about this? And you go, well, it's P.05. And they go, what does that mean? Well, it means five times out of 100, it sort of might not have been. Oh, so you're not certain then. And we should have been able to say, no, we are certain. And we didn't. I think the volunteerism side is absolutely the way forward. I mean, I, it's not that I've given up trying to press government and change and businesses and so forth, but it does come down to us as community to say, how are we going to change the way we do things? And when people do that, 
the small example, I know it's not climate change and it's a drop in the ocean, but the plastics issue that David upgrades, it has changed things, certainly in Britain, like that. Suddenly it becomes fine to tax plastic bags and you could jack the price up and everyone's rushing away from the plastics. Um, and that came from the bottom up. As soon as business felt that they, they had the permission to do it and government felt they could change tax, then both of them moved. But it came from us, it came from, from the citizens. And are you saying that that's a tipping point that we've witnessed in the past, say, even a year, that the plastics? In that small thing, yes, and, and that's the only thing. It, it took off, didn't it? It did, and it's the only thing that gave me hope, because um, I have no idea what it was like in Ireland, but when I was growing up, and I suppose I was a teenager, drink driving was entirely acceptable. It's particularly what blokes did. They went to the pub and they drove home drunk, and it was fine. And one year, it changed. And I've spoken to loads of people to ask what happened, and no one can quite explain it. Just something happened in the zeitgeist of the community where everyone just went, do you know what, that's not on anymore? And it largely stopped. And one can only hope that at some point we're going to reach the same sort and of thing. It happened point. in tobacco as well. It has sense. to a degree, yes. Although if you work where I work, probably 40% of people in the community I look after still smoke cigarettes and... My ward is largely full of smokers. Oh, well, that's because you're a doctor, yeah. yeah. But in, in, say... Yes, in, that's right. No, but in, in, in 1980, in, and, well, I may be wrong on the date, but 1970, something like 60... I went to a mm. world conference on health in, about tobacco in Madrid, and 60% of, of Spanish doctors smoked at that time. Yes, I had to rewrite a novel recently because all the doctors were smoking because it was, it was based in sort of late 90s, and they all did. Um, so there has been a really big chain. A tipping, I'm talking about tipping points, which is what you're saying about plastics. But there may be a moment when suddenly, and it partly I think came from that photo, all that imagery of the fish. I, does the audience agree on this? Just the, it, it, that was a shock to me, and I, I'm, mm. I like to be attentive to all of this. It was just the, the photograph, the still photograph of the fish's stomach. Yeah, it was I, absolutely. I, I, I think the two are probably a little different in their approaches. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a great believer that governments are there to legislate. So I think the cigarette smoking issue has largely had its traction, not from public health messaging, but because it's been taxed punitively, in, certainly in England, I'm sure the same here. The ban on smoking in public places made a really big difference too. We saw a drop in coronary event rates within six weeks of, of that happening. Um, the drink driving thing, there wasn't, well, the same laws had already existed for years, but there was something about the way people perceived the problem. I don't know whether people now have got the message about climate change overall. I think if they have, they probably don't realise how dangerous it is. And if they do realise how dangerous it is, they probably feel like most of us in this audience, which is pretty disempowered about what to do. I hope I have not left you feeling that you mustn't do anything if you want my honest opinion, I think we've absolutely had it. But I don't think that's a reason for not acting. Um, if you're faced with a survival problem, the only thing you can do is fight for your life. And that's what we've got to do. But we've got to treat it with that level of urgency. Yes. Just hello. here. Yeah. Hello. Take, yeah. take this, this woman first. She was, had her hand up earlier. Yeah. We we'll get you a microphone now. Yeah. Hello. We've talked about population a lot. Um, is there research that indicates that efforts in women's health with contraception and such would have an uh, effect on climate change? Well, there is an entire narrative which I'm not, it's not my strong suit, so I'm not going to talk too much about things I know nothing about. Um, there's a very strong women's health and women's narrative in the climate uh, dialogue. Um, because it's not just a matter of conception over which women are having increasing control, they're having increased societal impact. And probably, if I'm being sensible, if you take an awful lot of testosterone out of the equation, we probably wouldn't be in quite the situation we're currently in. Um, the contraception issue is important because it will help, as will reductions in poverty, reduce birth rates overall. But we're still seeing a very, very peculiar forcing in the opposite direction just now from countries that are developed. So that as you see this inverted pyramid and old fogies like me getting to the stage where we need you young people to be generating taxes, there aren't enough of you. And Britain has done the buck stupid thing of getting rid of the people who come in and work and pay those taxes by voting for Brexit. 
Um, the only other way you can manage it is to breed more of them. And some countries are strongly advocating increases in birth rate. You've seen this in China, it's happening in Russia. People being told to procreate more to try and cope with the problem. But that's a Ponzi scheme, isn't it? That's just going to be a perpetual motion system that will drive us into the dust. Um, so whilst I'm hopeful on one hand that women's control on conception, on conception will matter, I think it's going to be overridden by some of these other societal forcings, sad to say. Yes. Yeah. Um, Neil Abrolicon, a former um, Green politician and uh, also a uh, co-chair of the Galway Environmental Network, so I'd like to say hello to those watching online. But anyway, I'd just like to ask you, your, your lecture is very powerful. I, I would hasten to add that I, I, I don't really hear a hell of a lot new in what you're saying. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's information which has been out there for quite some time. Maybe yeah. it's more focused than it was previously and things have perhaps got a bit worse than they were, but the direction has been clear for a very long time. It has. Mm. But I suppose I'd like to ask you, I mean, as a former politician, I, I would say that the message you're giving here today certainly will get nobody elected. I, I wouldn't think if you go to door to door, um, you're going to get elected if you, if you say that. Mm. Um, you know, you're expecting miracles from politicians right. um, who try to preach those things. So I want to ask you the question, um, what are you hoping to achieve by giving this lecture here today and what would you like us to do um, having heard it and herding, heard how dire uh, things actually are? What would you like us to do one by one? It's a really good question and um, I'm not going to duck it, I will tell you. Um, the one thing I'll caveat that with though is to say that it's down to every individual to work out what they can do in their own space. So there isn't a recipe that's right for every single person. I think you're right about trying to give a message to a politician to carry, because this is not a, a vote winner, um, sad to say. But what we can do is start giving the permissive environment to politicians to allow them to say these things. It's not that all politicians are bad people from whatever party they're in. There are people who really do get this sort of issue, but are totally constrained by the electorate and the systems in which they work. So we need to start creating a permissive environment for them, number one. Start getting them the message to say, I will vote for you if you start saying these things, and I will not vote for you for the following reasons. And if there are enough of you, and the young people in this audience, you're all excellent at the social media things, you can start creating those sorts of bits of pressure. I was told by an MP in the UK recently that if they get 24 written letters, they have to report that to their whip. Because unlike emails, if 24 people have bothered to pick up a pen, it normally means there's something quite serious going on. So let's start talking to our politicians and empowering them. I think moving money is very important. Um, I, think I, you know, I think activism works well when it redirects money. And one can start choosing the businesses that are making the right choices and trying to spend with them and stopping spending against the others and making it clear to those businesses and their shareholders why you've made those decisions. So if one gets in the field, which you obviously are working in the field that you work in and as a politician, you know, the Unilevers of the world, the Paul Polmans and things, have really tried to steer their businesses very aggressively in the green direction. And what their shareholders and board need to hear is that they're being lauded for that and rewarded by purchase. Um, because otherwise, as soon as Polman's gone, that board could easily retrench and start behaving in a totally different way. It depends, it's changed where I bank. So I bank with a green bank in the United Kingdom. We can all switch where we spend our money. I don't know what choices you have here in Ireland to the green energy suppliers, but mine, it's relatively easy in Britain to have 100% green and renewable. It's a relatively small sum of money I spend on electricity every year. But if lots of other people do it, and we're trying to move the whole of the medical community, and by which I mean not just doctors, nurses, and paramedical people in every domain, we're trying to get them all moving across together. That sort of change in money does start changing the markets. It also starts changing where people are investing. So it's about political pressure, pressure and permissiveness. It's about financial movement of money. I think those are the two big players. Um, and then there's the personal, professional, and political domain separately. So the personal thing, if, you know, if you, any of you haven't done it, do your carbon footprint. Um, it's quite revealing. It will show you where you're bad, where you can make the really big wins, and how to move. And so I fess up. It's quite clear I got here by an aeroplane today. That's a massive quantity of carbon dioxide. It's, it's something I do have to weigh up. Um, 
about whether it's worth coming to talk given the cost of another metric tonne or whatever it might have been as CO2. But if we do those, that's the personal and change our personal behaviours and influence those around us. The professional, um, my world is medical, so I've worked with the Royal Colleges in Great Britain, with the Department of Health, to try to steer the medical community and internationally, where some of us here have met before at the COP negotiations. And then the politically, which is, in my case, trying to find ways to um, support politicians, actually, rather than just beat them up. I think they get beaten up quite a lot. Um, but, Paul, yes, George Lee. Yeah. Thank you. Hugh, my name is George Lee, and I work with RTE, uh, which is our radio and television Indeed. broadcaster. And it's just one thing which strikes me as I hear you speak about individuals and their role and what they could do. Mm. And I just think that there's something missing in relation to governance, which is a completely different level. Mm. As you just described in a talk, which I have no doubt that you bring to many parts of the world, uh, the threat and the threat is clearly global, and it is one little ball of mm. atmosphere that I think that you put up there. Uh, but when it comes to action and people do what they can and you get a movement from the ground up, yes. you still run the risk of the governance. Yes. This is a global problem. Mm. I think in Europe, perhaps if the UK does leave the EU, we might get a climate tax or a mm. carbon tax introduced at EU level because we've had plenty of promises that would be brought in here and no action whatsoever Correct. because people are ingenious at coming up with reasons not to take action. Yes. When you look at the world today, you see people faced off against each other, seeing the enemy as each other, sovereignty. We need yes. our borders. We're going to compete for the oil in the Arctic. We're going to uh, look for Caspian Sea, mm. warm water ports, whatever it is. Yes. It's, the issue is that people see each other as the enemy rather than this global climate change and we're faced off against each other, yes. where the real issue is something well above everybody's head. So people coming from the ground and doing individual things and, and having a, a, a wooden fork instead of a plastic fork when they go into the fast food restaurant will do one thing, but it is a global governance issue, is it not? And you're only one step away from selling that message because that's one of the scariest presentations of the climate problem that I think I have seen. But you missed the point to me, which is that this is about not just individuals. We have to make choices about governance and be prepared not to look upon ourselves as being sovereign in a small little way because we won't get anywhere. No, you're absolutely correct. So um, the changes that we will see will be alluding almost to the cigarette issue. It's by legislation and changes in global governance. So there's an organisation called Client Earth you may have come across that's been pushing for that at a global level. We've got to, though, to pressure our politicians to lead, and to lead, if it's gonna be the EU, crack on, let's let them see that leadership. Because at the moment, it's been the big problem with the COP negotiations. If you have upwards of 190 people, and you've got six people who genuinely don't want any sort of deal, because they've got oil, coal, gas, or whatever else, they will stymie that process, and you will never, ever get an agreement. So we need people who will lead and say, we're going to do the right thing and we're going to legislate. And for me, I think the EU could absolutely do that because there is enough political and financial muscle there to change the way things work. And some of these taxation policies, I'm absolutely not an economist, but some of the taxation policies proposed, I think by one of my colleagues, Jim Hansen from the States, has been really very progressive. Um, Jim's view is that you tax the CO2 or the greenhouse gas at site of production or at import, very heavily, really punitively. But the fun part that he's come up with is that you give all of that money to the general population into their bank accounts once a year. So you might wake up in the morning with an extra 50,000 euros in your bank account. You're just going to find that flying to North America is going to cost you 12,000 euros, not 400. But you've got a choice, right? You've got an extra 50 grand in the bank but you will probably choose to spend that in places that are low carbon because they're not being taxed in that punitive fashion. So I'm not suggesting that has to be the answer, but it does suggest that it can be done. There are ways of doing it that will be equitable to the members of society more broadly. But we do need to bring it in and we need to ratchet it and we need to make that ratchet really clear. There's a price per metric ton of CO2 and it is going to go north by this amount every year, because if we signal that to business, they will adapt. Businesses will not go under, they will just change. 
Yes, I, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment. Just, I just want to ask one question. Yeah. Businesses, uh, businesses know the bottom line, mm. but they also, you couldn't overestimate the, the, the vanity that they feel about their own product and their own firm in terms of corporate social responsibility. They even have a term for it, which they boast about. Mm. And some of them, as you've mentioned, do quite well. They're certainly doing better than they used to do. But how does one get to that tipping point, that trigger? Because I do think we're talking about tipping points and trigger. I think it happened in tobacco. And the reason it happened in tobacco is that the smokers became embarrassed and slightly ashamed. They certainly stopped offering you a cigarette. When they, they, they didn't feel any sense of guilt, as they used to do, about opening a packet and just smoking themselves. Or they then began saying, do you mind if I smoke? So, it, you know, it, it's really quite subtle. You get an, an attitude of knowledge which we have now from papers like yours, knowledge, attitude, and then change. People find it hard to actually make the final point of change. It's, it's true. Um, the, the problem with all of these things is that we just haven't got the time for it. So, the, I mean, the, the Dole paper came out now, what, 60-odd years ago. We've known about the effects of cigarette smoking, and yet a quarter of adults still smoke in Britain. Um, it's taking a hell of a long time. And we've known about the effects of greenhouse gases for, well, since the Royal Institution's first experiments reporting the effects. And that's well over 100 years ago. And we still aren't acting. We're still increasing the CO2 emissions by over 1.6% 1, 1. last year and 2% the year before. Um, we do need a very, very much more radical change right now. And I take your point entirely. This, this has to be legislation um, we can't get our green politicians elected because they haven't got a story to sell. So we've got to create the permissive environment for politicians who are incumbent to feel they can make those changes, whether they're from the right or from the left. But we've got to start making some demands, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jane Jackson. I'm from 80 Max, where we're getting people to cut their transport emissions. And from what you were saying, it does have to be come from the bottom up. Mm. It's literally cutting it by a thousand cuts, you can say, because everything has to be cut. Yeah. And uh, it does grow, and there is, as John was saying, there is a tipping point. We started back in uh, June, July, with this, with this very tiny little campaign. And we've been doing, we did uh, national ploughing championships, and we're doing uh, markets around the place with our stand. Now we did the same market back in June, then we're doing it again, and we've done it like the last week was the third time we did it. The first couple of times got people to sign up to pledge to drive no faster than 80 kilometers per hour to cut their greenhouse emissions, right? And you're getting six people for a whole day at the market, or seven people. Last, the weekend before last, the exact same market, people are coming up, oh, I've heard about that. We got 61 people at that market. So it, is, it can grow from the bottom up, and what we're trying to do is trying to, to push the government. It gives them, the, gives them the mandate to change the law. You could overnight, you could cut transport emissions by a third by simply bringing it down to 80 kilometres per, per hour. And if you do that across the world, it is huge. Yes. It's the fastest growing sector in the world, is transport. But I think you're right, and this, it raises this issue of what one can do to give politicians other reasons for acting. So um, we heard at the beginning that the second Lancet Commission report um, was commenting on this business of co-benefits. So that's really saying that action that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, quite independently of climate change, just happens to have massive benefits to human health. So if we substitute walking and cycling for burning fossil fuels, we get less greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera, but we get less particulate pollution, which means less dementia, strokes, heart attacks, and so forth. We get less obesity, osteoporosis. We get less diabetes. We get less breast cancer. We get less bowel cancer. All of those things happen in the same way that they do from reduced red meat consumption and so forth, which happens to benefit the climate, but also happens to massively improve public health. And when we ask Paul Eakins and others and the health economists to come up with the numbers, these are trillions of dollars that can be saved. Trillions of dollars. These are not trivial sums of money every year. And you could probably recover a very generous proportion of the expenditure on changing to the green economy from the savings in health economic costs by keeping us all better and healthier into uh, our old age. 
So again, those are messages we've just got to try to get to people. It is, if we are going to just talk dollars and euros, there's a good message here about dollars and euros too. Uh, Damien Nee, uh, what I can never get, we're here preaching to the converted. Right. And if you take the great global movements of one kind or other in the last hundred years, say the anti-nuclear program, where mm. you've got tens of thousands of people on the street, the anti-war movements, mm -hmm. say the way that mobilization was done in 1942 in the States at the beginning of the Second World War, why have we failed to get a populist movement to demand change? Like mm. what this lady here was saying is so accurate that you, it has to come from the ground up. But why have we failing to make that happen? I, it's a good question. I think it's for a couple of reasons. I think, firstly, um, most people don't feel under immediate threat. The number of times we've been told in the last 20 years, oh, when it starts going wrong, then people will start acting. Well, get real, look around. It's gone wrong. It's gone badly wrong in recent years. But actually, for most of us, life carries on. So I think people don't feel the threat very immediately. And there is a narrative which has entered into this business of communicating climate change is you can't tell people bad news because people switch off. And it's probably true. The sociologists tell us it's true that if you say things like I've just told you, people go, I don't want to hear that, and they run away. And what you're meant to do is offer them a nicer narrative, sell them a, a, a dream. The problem with that is that if you go to rich people and say life could be so much better if the world was to be green environmentally friendly, the very rich will go, so much better than what? I'm loaded. Life's great for me. Um, if you come to those of us that earn a reasonable salary, sort of middle classes, medics and so forth, and you say life can be so much better, they'll say better than what? Better than I've got a house and I go on holiday and I get to go skiing every year or whatever it might be. If you go to poor people, single mothers of five or unemployed dads, and you go life could be so much better. They go, yeah, and it won't be because I'm buying organic something or other and everything else. I, I'll do anything to keep my kids alive. So there isn't a positive message you can sell. And in fact, most of the ev evidence coming out of George Mason, for instance, says there's only one thing that seems to affect people's behavior, and that's thinking that other people are doing it. So I can give you a million facts for why you should change, and you won't. But if I say, do you know what, you're the only guy in this whole audience who hasn't done something, then you change which brings us back to this tipping point issue. How do we get enough people that the, out, that the outliers feel like outliers or that everyone feels like an outlier that has to fall into line in doing the right thing? Time for just one more, one more question, I'm afraid. Sorry, but that's just this gentleman. Okay. Um, Shane Reif, I'm a uh, water engineer here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I think I heard your comment about uh, governance, right, and global governance, and I think I've heard that uh, a lot over the last decade, but a lot of people are losing faith that anything will happen, yeah. right? And at what point do we start talking more about uh, the responsibility of companies that may have more resources, uh, more impact, mm. and frankly, more money to spend, and maybe even um, have more uh, of a reason for something to be done because of the long-term impact on their company. Yeah. Um, is that something that you can see as having equal importance to global governance, where companies need to start recognizing their responsibility as well? Yeah, I think in many ways it's, it's uh, quicker and easier, because I'm meant to put a cross in a box every five years about everything relating to Britain's place in Europe, to NATO, to National Health Service, to taxation and education, to climate change. I, I can do that, but it's not an easy balance to put those things together. Um, and it only happens every few years. Whereas we can change our spending right now. And if we all do it at once, and I think boycotting companies is fine, and I think rewarding companies is fine, that will change very, very quickly when that happens. Very quickly. And we've seen some of those campaigns without being specific about them, I guess we're all aware of some of those campaigns of boycotts, that when they've happened, companies have changed their behaviours in weeks. Um, so let's do that again. Let's start making clear what we think is unacceptable and let's start rewarding the people 
that we think should be rewarded, not just do it by spending the money, but making it clear to their shareholders about why we're doing it and to their boards. And then they will go where the money is. They don't have to be good people. They just have to follow the cash. So, yes, I think it's a quicker way sometimes than dealing with the body politic. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hugh Montgomery. Thank you. One final, one final question, Hugh. What are the titles of your books, of those children's books? I don't, not the 500 the scientific papers. We, we can find those on the internet. Um, well, the one that actually brings me out in a cold sweat, because uh, I did a book tour when my first children's book was called The Voyage of the Arctic Turn, and I was savaged by the bloody turkey on RTE. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thanks very much for that. I've got your name. Um, yeah, that was the voyage of the Arctic turn. And the, the, the second was, a, a, was an environmental, not polemic, but that was called Cloud Sailors. There's another few out there. There's one called Genie in the Bottle. Um, and there's a thriller coming out next year. That's got nothing at all to do with climate change. Though, so. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you also to our audience here. Yes, thank you very much. And to, and to Galway. Uh, and this has been webcast and is available on the EPA site, as are many of the books that were down at the back but have been collected already, but they're all online anyway. And thank you again for being such a good audience. Thank you.